I remember Carl saying we were over at uh, getting ready for this test in uh, atmospheric, atmospheric physics, and uh, he said to me, you know, Jim, I used to think that when you would go down, you could only go down so far, but then everything was up, but I realized that you can wander around down here. And, and so the professor we were we were being the taught, that taught the course used to say about us, oh, you two guys are on a banana peel in the graduate college, you know, you're going to be out of here soon. Anyway, it didn't turn out that way. He was born in New Braunfels, Texas, moved with his family to Oklahoma, and because of Carl's asthma and allergies, landed in Phoenix at age 10. His father was a horse trainer, and Carl was practically raised at racetracks in the winters in Phoenix, summers in Southern California. That life had him see the world as a place where you take chances, where you bet, sometimes everything on the big win, a trait that influenced his entire life. It was not until later that he realized his biggest allergy was to horses. Carl attended West High School and through college worked as a construction laborer during Phoenix's brutally hot summers for a few dollars a day. Something he'd never forget, making him simpatico with Mexican and later Eritrean laborers, fishermen, and farmers. You'd often see Carl wielding a shovel alongside Eritrean laborers 40 years his junior. It was that leadership that had hundreds of workers earning less than two dollars a day work their hearts out to build for their country and help Carl fulfill his radical vision to create an extraordinary seawater-based aquaculture and agriculture project the world has ever seen. In 1955 at the University of Arizona while studying atmospheric physics that Carl first realized decades before most anyone else that our planet's climate was beginning to change. He stumbled into a meeting of the fledgling International Solar Energy Society, became active, and soon its secretary-treasurer. He attended a course at the University of Chicago in response to Sputnik and the space race, and that changed his life again. These past 60 years can be traced by the flow of global needs, as well as the learning curve of using the largest renewable resource on the planet, seawater. Carl graduated with a degree in mathematics from the U of A in 1959, returned as a graduate student, and joined the Institute for Atmospheric Physics, where Dr. Richard Cassander recognized Carl's ability to synthesize complex problems and appointed him as the supervisor at the U of A's Solar Energy Research Laboratory. Dick was a mentor to Carl for the next 40 years, another relationship that was critically important to Carl's future. He started working on finding efficient ways to use water to green the desert. Carl devised a prototype solar still as a graduate project. He knew water was the key to survival and prosperity. Here he first connected the importance of solar radiation, water demand, power and food production. And he started building a team of scientists and broad thinkers. It didn't take long for Carl to recognize that the logical source for large quantities of water was the oceans. But where to put the still near the oceans? Once again, he has done all his life, Carl found a collaborator who owned property in Puerto Penasco, Mexico, on the coast of the Sea of Cortez, and a quick 55-minute plane ride from Tucson. Puerto Penasco, then a small fishing village, only had access to fresh water from a well nearly 100 kilometers away, and building a solar still there would have huge scientific and humanitarian value. The project got built in partnership with the University of Sonora and produced 6,000 gallons of fresh water a day, most of it given to local communities just for the asking. And what else could you do with that fresh water? The question asked time after time as one part of the project came online. What next to further the water, power, food agenda? In 1962, Carl was featured in a Saturday evening post story headed by the words, Water Wizard. 
and quoted near the end saying how he dreams of the day seawater will turn a desert green. With Cassandra's help, a Rockefeller Foundation grant funded Carl and his team to build inflatable greenhouses in Puerto Penasco that used the fresh water distilled from seawater to grow cucumbers, squash, tomatoes, and other vegetables. With that success, Rockefeller wanted young Carl to travel the world and give talks about the water food production system. The trip to Europe, the Mideast, India, and Asia catalyzed scientific associations, personal friendships, and projects that have lasted until now. Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan of Abu Dhabi, then part of the Trucial States before it became the United Arab Emirates, funded a project to build greenhouses on barren Sadiat Island to grow high-value vegetables for his people. Carl and the team's work didn't exactly fit into the silos of traditional university departments, and once again, with the help of Dick Cassander, created a new facility not affiliated with a single university college, the Environmental Research Laboratory. Tucson International Airport leased the U of A 18 acres for a dollar a year. What followed was a series of buildings, laboratories, and greenhouses that housed the very unsiloed team of academics, engineers, marine architects, plant biologists, animal nutritionists, and shrimp pathologies, and eventually a new discipline, climate scientists. Through Dick Cassander, Carl became good friends with Walter R. Roberts, the founding director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research. NCAR's cutting-edge Cray computer projections gave Carl early access to what the future of our planet's climate might be. This information helped define Carl's life's work. As before, the question now was, what next? Carl successfully producing expensive fresh water and surrounding by unlimited free ocean water. The question now, what kind of high profit cash crops can you grow using seawater in a small Mexican village. Carl, through whatever thought process he uses, moved from plants to animals, shrimp in particular. What if you could grow shrimp in these greenhouses? Once again, Carl turned the world kind of upside down. Raceways filled with seawater were installed in the greenhouses. A seawater well was drilled near the shore and the aquaculture industry was born. Shrimp were being grown and sold. Carl's team had mastered the breeding cycle of shrimp, something never accomplished before. Sophisticated shrimp feed diets were developed by his friend Saul Katzen at ERL, and a shrimp pathologist was in-house. However, there was an issue. Intensive shrimp production, like every other intensive animal production system, has a glaring problem. Animal waste. So what can you do with fertilizer that's swimming around in salt water? Before we go down that halophytic lined winding road, it's appropriate to take a couple of important detours, the kind Carl took his entire life that made all of his life work so much more interesting and valuable to all of us. In the 60s, another visionary, Walt Disney, acquired land in Central Florida to build an experimental prototype community of tomorrow. The original funding failed to materialize, but Epcot, with new vision, morphed into another park-like attraction conceived to show off the technologies of the future. Marty Sklar, the president of Disney Imagineering, found Carl Hodges, and after visiting ERL, hired him and the rest of the ERL team to be science advisors for the new land pavilion at Epcot. It was and is a showcase for agricultural practices visited by over 12 million people last year alone. The kind of exposure any scientist would be thrilled to have. And incidentally, at its opening in 1982, had halophytes. In the mid 1980s, a group called Decisions Team Limited had a vision of a closed system demonstration project on Earth. Previously, closed systems work had been done by the Russians, and the DTL team asked them where they should build their Biosphere 2 project in the United States. 
The answer? As close to Carl Hodges as you can get. They bought land just north of Tucson, where ERL and Carl became the intensive agriculture biomes scientific consultants. The lessons learned and the science explored at Biosphere 2 continue on the direction of the University of Arizona and Joaquin Ruiz to this day. ERL had over 150 scientists and staff working at the Tucson lab and around the world with trials for landscape halophytes in Hargata, Egypt, Salicornia in Pakistan and Guerrero Negro, Baja California, Mexico. Carl looked for places that had farmland abandoned because of lack of fresh water, flat land, places where people needed jobs, places where a country needed exports for income. Almaz Nagash, an Eritrean woman, befriended Carl at a conference after hearing talk about his seawater agriculture and introduced him to the new government, just freed from a 20-year war and in need of food, exports, and jobs. Things moved quickly. The government was in full support and the site was selected near the Red Sea port of Masawa. Carl arrived in December 1999 with post-larval shrimp and salicornia seed. He gathered a few people who had worked on his previous projects and within a year had the evidence to prove the site could sustain a shrimp crop, field crops, and what Carl says is most important, the people of Eritrea were ready to work and build a new industry. Seawater Farms Eritrea. In two years, there was a productive 1,000 hectare farm with seed harvests, mangrove forests, a ton of shrimp a week being flown to Europe, and another six tons weekly in the pipeline. This was an extraordinary success for Eritrea. In 2002, they told a story in Johannesburg, South Africa, at a United Nations conference on critical water needs. They built a room that housed mangrove trees on its roof, seen all over the exhibit hall, with roots hanging so conference participants could walk through them. It shouted to the world that clean air comes from greening the land while sequestering carbon and producing crops. A Hodges team, both in the States and in Eritrea, engaged in the Carbon Credit Certification Program for the World Bank Biocarbon Fund. Sadly, politics caused the jewel of seawater farms in Eritrea to be terminated, but work continued stateside with Salicornia as the focus. At scale, these seawater crops and technologies will feed people and animals, as well as produce biofuels that do not depend on fresh water needed for humans. It will sequester large quantities of carbon while creating jobs and security for millions. 35 years after the Saturday Evening Post article, with Carl wishing he could make the deserts green, Vanity Fair magazine featured Carl and it noted that he is making the deserts green. Carl is truly a planetary citizen. He is at home wherever he lands, finding people always, he says, extraordinary. And it is reciprocated. Extraordinary is the single word to describe this extraordinary person.